Hi there. Oh, it's on. Uh, I'm Andrew Sforgax uh, from, uh, from Modern Meadow. And uh, I'm really delighted to be here. This is a great gathering. And I feel that the, the speakers that you've heard from are uh, actually a great, uh, great lead-in to what we're uh, about to talk uh, here as well. Um, so what we do at Modern Meadow is we're developing a fundamentally new way of growing animal products. So you've already heard about, um, about aeroponic farming from David. Um, and you've heard about the, the Brooklyn food movement from, uh, from, from Eric. Uh, so we're essentially applying the principles of urban farming, of aeroponic farming, uh, to growing animal products in places like Brooklyn. And if you think about that, how do you grow animal products, not you know, out in the field, but, but, in a, but in an urban setting? You need a fundamentally different approach to do that. And, um, and the way we do it is we grow animal products from the cells on up. Uh, the background to this is that I previously founded a company called Organovo, which grew uh, human tissues using 3D bioprinting technology. We developed, we pioneered 3D bioprinting, which allowed us to grow little human tissues, little human body parts, like livers and kidney and skin tissue, which currently pharmaceutical companies use to test and develop new drugs. And, and we thought to ourselves, well, gosh, if we can, gra if we can create medical-grade human tissues, could we also grow skin that could be made into leather? Could we also grow muscle that could be made into meat? And when we were first considering these ideas, we thought they were very fringe. But over time, it, 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 it occurred to us that there actually is a strong value proposition to doing this. So the idea is that we can actually make better animal products. We can make things like meat and leather better in ways that are fundamentally better and in a way that doesn't require killing animals and doesn't have nearly the same amount of, uh, of harm to the environment. And the reason to do this is, uh, at this point, I think, well known by, by most of you in the audience. We've got a lot of people on the world, uh, 7 billion people. And each year, we, we raise and slaughter about 60 billion animals to provide for our meat, dairy, eggs, and leather goods. And over the course of the next few decades, the demand for animal products is expected to nearly double. And so, and this is driven by population growth. It's driven by growing uh, wealth and a growing middle class globally. But the question is, how do you satisfy this, this, this growth globally when already today the livestock industry uh, is the leading user of land, directly and indirectly, the leading user of water, and the leading contributor to greenhouse gas emissions? So these are not numbers that you can double. You can't double these numbers to satisfy the doubling of demand. So we have to be more creative. We have to come up with solutions on the demand side, whether that means we have different diets, or we're more flexitarian, we eat more vegetables. Um, we have to come up with solutions around efficiency, minimizing waste. Uh, but we also have to come up with supply side innovations, new, new types of products. And um, there's a whole bunch of exciting innovation in developing new products that can satisfy our demand for meat. Um, there's some real innovation happening in plant-based solutions. And we represent one alternative, one possibility around animal cell-based solutions. So our big insight is why raise the entire animal, um, which takes two to three years and uh, a lot of care and feeding, when you can actually make the products that you'd like from the cells themselves. And we do this. Uh, this is actually not a new idea. It's been talked about for a long, long, long time, almost 100 years. Um, and in fact, Churchill wrote about it 80 years ago. He said, if you think about it, the way we farm our livestock is absurd. It's very, very inefficient. And there should be a way to grow the products we need from the cells themselves in, a, in, a, in its own uh, suitable medium. And you've already heard David talk about growing plants by providing the nutrition to the, to the roots um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the gases to the, to the leaves. Well, this is analogous to that, uh, growing the animal products by feeding the cells themselves rather than raising the entire animal. And the way we do this is we, I'm giving you the, the analogy of how we do it right now for leather. So we've got a materials program and we've got a food program. And uh, we're commercializing our materials first. So that's where the, 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 the near term uh, commercial emphasis is for our company. But we've made an incredible amount of progress in both programs, our materials and food. And we've also, we've had prototypes in both. Uh, but I'll give you the example of how we culture leather. How do we grow leather? 
We take cells from an animal uh, through a biopsy, and this can be any animal, so it can be a cow, a, 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 an ostrich, a crocodile, any animal, and it doesn't need to harm the animal. Uh, so the uh, Bessie the cow can go on uh, living a very happy life. And once we've taken these cells from the biopsy, we isolate the skin cells, um, and we, we grow them in, in very large quantities. And we can do things uh, to these cells so that we may never need to go back to the animal again. And, and we're building up this big library of cells of different types of animals and, and getting them to, to grow really fast and produce a lot of collagen, which is the main building block of, of, of leather. So we've grown a lot of cells. We can create millions and you know, billions and billions and billions of cells from a single biopsy. We grow these cells on a sheet. Uh, and under the right conditions, when they touch one another, when they achieve confluence, they produce lots of collagen. And collagen is the main building block of leather. And then we layer these sheets together and get the collagen fiber network to be uh, isometric, where it's got strength in, uh, in all dimensions. And essentially, what you have there is you have hide. But it's a hide that doesn't have hair, flesh, or fat on it. And as a result, when you, when you tan this hide, you don't need to go through the really, really messy beam house operation steps, which are removing hair, removing flesh, removing fat. Um, and, and that's a lot cleaner uh, at that stage. And then we go through a tanning process and the finishing process. And then we work with, uh, with companies, whether they're luxury, fashion, sport, et cetera, to create uh, finished products. Now, on our food program, we, uh, we, we introduced this idea back in 2011 at TED Med, uh, where my father, who's my co-founder both in my previous company, Organovo, and in Modern Meadow, uh, he was up on stage talking about growing uh, uh, tissues for medical applications, and then a few hours later was invited back up on stage for a little cooking demonstration. <laughs> and so right before lunch, he, he took out uh, a little pork chop that was grown without killing a pig, uh, salted, peppered it, and uh, cooked it on stage, and ate it. Uh, and it was, it was quite sensational at the time. Um, and I'm happy to say that he's still alive and well. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, in 2013, in the, in, uh, at, at, in, uh, the TED Global stage, uh, I showed our first prototypes for leather. So what, what I'm talking about here is not crazy science fiction. It's real. We've made a lot of progress uh, since these uh, early demonstrations. Uh, but, but it's very exciting that if you can fundamentally reinvent what meat, meat can be, what animal protein can be in its edible form, and if you can fundamentally reimagine what materials can be, like leather, what, what, what biomaterials can do in terms of design and performance, the possibilities are quite exciting. In terms of environmental impact, if you compare slaughtering um, uh, an animal versus growing animal products from the cells themselves, culturing them, uh, the environmental benefits are huge. Uh, this is a study out of Oxford from a few years ago. Um, and it, it requires much less land, uh, much less water, uh, much lower amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, and about half as much energy. And this study actually looked at slaughtered meat versus cultured meat. Uh, if you extend this uh, analysis to leather, leather actually has a longer supply chain. So the, 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 the comparison between producing leather uh, uh, slaughtered versus cultured may actually be even more favorable. Now, when I said that one of the exciting things is that you can, you can reimagine uh, what materials can do and you can reimagine what, what, uh, what, what food can do, um, I want to emphasize this, that our goal is not perfect biomimicry. When we're developing new kinds of, uh, of foods with this, it's not about creating the I can't believe this is not a slaughtered hamburger <laughs> or, you know, or, 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 or steak or, or, or hot dog. That's not our goal. If, if you went through all of this great research and innovation and came up with this, this, uh, this facsimile product, it would, be, uh, it, it would be inauthentic and it also would be short selling the possibilities. What's exciting here is that we can really, really reimagine um, what, what, what are the possibilities? We can come up with foods that are delicious, that are really nutritious, that are healthy, uh, that are convenient. And right now, we're, um, we're working with some really high-end chefs, very innovative chefs, to, to imagine uh, and to develop fundamentally new form factors for animal protein that are, um, that are, that are really authentic, 
but at the same time innovative. And, it, and I know it sounds like it's a contradiction because this is so new and, 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 and different, but that's our goal. Our goal is to come up with something that builds on, um, on, 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 on some traditions that, that we're actually quite used to in, in cooking. So the tradition, for example, of culturing is not new in cuisine. It's, it's been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. We brew, we culture, we ferment uh, a lot of foods. We do this for yogurt, we do this for wine, we do this with beer, we do this with yeast and bread. So there's a lot of foods that we're used to culturing and fermenting. And essentially, this is an extension of that kind of approach. So to say that we're basically another Brooklyn-based uh, fermenting or pickling company is perhaps a little reductive, but that's essentially uh, uh, very much the tradition that we're looking to build on. Uh, an example of the kind of innovation that is possible is a concept that we developed last year. It, it, it was a, a, on a bit of a dare. I spoke at the Google Solve for X conference in 2013, and I, I, I gave this talk about, you know, what if we could reimagine meat? And then I told the organizers, hey, if we can develop this uh, for next year's uh, event, I'd, I'd love to serve uh, some appetizers. And then I completely forgot about having made this commitment. <laughs> So then the organizers asked me a couple, couple months before Solve4x last year, they said, okay, so Andres, uh, Solve4x is coming up. Uh, we've got 70 people coming. Uh, do you have the appetizers ready? And we were very much focusing on, on leather at the time, and we completely forgot about this. So we scrambled and, and we came up with something that, that we thought was, 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 uh, was quite clever um, and illustrated this point that we don't have to be biomimetic. We call this steak chips. And essentially, it's a crispy, crunchy beef jerky. It looks like a potato chip, but it's made entirely of, of meat. Um, and what's great about it is that it's, 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 it's made without having to harm animals or the environment, a much lower impact on the environment. It's nutritionally extremely high value. So this is a snack food uh, concept that's 70% protein, very little fat, uh, less than 8% fat. And if you compare that to potato chip, which is about 40% fat, like no protein, this is incredibly healthy uh, by comparison. It could essentially be a snack food for athletes. Um, it's delicious. It's got a very nice umami flavor. We've made uh, Asian teriyaki flavor uh, version. We've made a poblano barbecue version. Um, it's got very high quality ingredients. So all the ingredients that we use in this are natural. It's natural cells grown in natural ingredients. It's a process you can actually explain to your uh, grandmother. And in fact, what's nice about this is that Unlike the way animal products are produced today, this is a process where you can actually come and see how the, how, how the process is made. You can visit, uh, in the future, our, our aspiration is very much that you can visit um, the way we brew meat as if, it, as, as if you are visiting a brewery. Um, so how do we make steak chips? Again, um, this is similar to the way we make leather in some ways. We take cells from an animal, it doesn't have to harm the animal, and we and this time it's, it's muscle cells, and then we expand the cells in large quantities using a cell culture medium. So this is a, um, a soup, if you will, that the cells grow in. It's got uh, amino acids, uh, uh, vitamins, minerals, sugars, uh, everything that a growing cell needs. Um, and then once we've got a large quantity of cells, we add pectin, and pectin is a fruit sugar that congeals jam. So it's a very natural ingredient. It comes from apples or citrus. Um, and so we've, we've got this, um, we've got, we've got the, the meat uh, with pectin, and, and then we add our, 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 our flavoring. So we've been working with some chefs uh, last year when we were doing this to develop the teriyaki flavor, the wasabi, uh, uh, shiitake mushroom flavor, wasabi flavor, and uh, uh, poblano barbecue flavor, which is my favorite. Um, and then we cook it in a food dehydrator, and we create this, uh, this crunchy beef jerky uh, concept. And so we served it at, at Google Software X. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and since then, we've had, we've been fairly low key about it. Um, we've we fed so far about 150 or so people in these private uh, tastings. Uh, everybody from, uh, from Sergey Brin, who was the very first person to taste it uh, outside of the company, to Peter Thiel, and Mark Andreessen, and lots and lots and lots of other people. And I'm happy to say that, to my knowledge, they're all still alive and well. Um, and the feedback has been very, very positive. Again, we're not quite sure that this is a product, this is the product that we're committed to because right now we're developing, we're working with some chefs to, to really come up with some, some, some different directions that we can explore for the, for the food product. 
but we're very much in a learning mode and, uh, and we're excited about the directions in which this can go. So again, our, our, our vision um, is that on both leather and meat, it, it, it would be a completely different way of, of growing these products. Rather than this happening in slaughterhouses uh, far away uh, from where people can, can see what happens uh, that, are, that are hidden and guarded, it, it could happen in, in urban centers. Uh, and there could be your friendly neighborhood artisanal meat brewery. Uh, and you could, you could go there. Uh, you, could, you could actually understand uh, the ingredients that go into it. Um, and and you, can, you, can, you can learn about the process and then sample the product at the end. So we hope that uh, as we continue to develop this, that we can have a future that is much more cultured uh, for, for both materials and for foods. Thank you very much.